All right, so I guess I'm supposed to be doing a transportation review. Um, transportation and surveying has a lot of kind of things that go together and some things that don't. The first thing I'm going to cover is just the transportation side. But if we have time, we'll go back and I'll hit a couple of like the earthwork problems and some of the layout problems as well. Um, first off, as far as the FE is concerned, there's two of the most important things I can tell you about the FE. Know your formula book backward and forward. Be able to turn to any page in it at any time you need to. If you see a problem, know what section it's in, be able to turn that section in your formula book. That'll help you more than anything else on the test. Second, know how to work whatever calculator you're using. Um, so it doesn't matter which one you decide to use, make sure you know how to work it well. Um, that'll help as well. Um, the first thing I want to do is cover a couple of equations that are in the formula book that were on my test. Um, and they're fairly simple equations that you should probably know. The first one is this DDHD here. Uh, it's equal to AADT times K times D. What this is, the directional design hourly volume. Uh, if you're given an AADT, which is an average annual design traffic, uh, then you multiply it by K and you multiply it by D. These are both factors that will probably be given in the problem. If not, I don't remember K. I think K is 15%. Um, I know D is somewhere between 50 and 75%. Uh, percent. I'm pretty sure K is 15. That's a room. Yeah. Um, but what this is, AADT is your average annual daily traffic. Your K factor changes that into a design alloy volume, or DHV. And then your D factor changes the DHV into directional hourly volume. The D factor is the directional factor. Every kind of get that, I'll kind of go through a problem uh, with that too. So essentially what will happen is they'll give you a K, or they should give you a K, we'll say it's 17%, and they should give you a D, and it's probably going to be 70, 75%, and then they'll give you an AADT of 3,000. Um, you just multiply it out. I mean, if you want me to work through it, I can, but it's, it's simple enough. You just work, work through that. That's essentially what a problem like that will look like. And the only reason I bring it up, like I say, is because that formula isn't in your, isn't in your FE review manual or FE formula. So one Another formula like that is uh, the peak hour factor. You want to know what the peak hour factor is? Okay, that's enough. Um, peak hour factor, it's the PHF. It's equal to the peak hourly volume. This is peak hourly volume divided by the hourly volume. And I'll work through a problem like this. There's one in that book I'm going to work through a little later. But, um, so now, from this, does anybody know what the peak hourly volume is? This is just an addition of your traffic counts over an hour. Does anybody know what the peak hour volume is? So what you take here, if you're given, typically you'll be given traffic counts in 15-minute counts. Um, if they're not in 15-minute counts, you'll have to put them in them, but they shouldn't give you anything that's not in 15-minute counts. So you'll be given four 15-minute counts. So this would be like from 4 to 4.15, 4.15, 4.30, 4.30, 4.30, 4.30, 4.30, 4.30, 4.30, 4.30, 4.30, 4.30, 4.30, 4.30, 4.30, 4.30, 4.30, 4.30, 4.30, 4.30, 
Um, like I said, I'll work through an actual example in a second um, of a problem like that. <coughs> set there are two equations uh, it's uh, time mean speed and space mean speed and I'm just going to work an example to show you all those because it'll just be easier to do it that way so if this is what it gives you as far as an input and it asks you to find space mean speed and time mean speed so the space mean speed the formula for it is N D over the sum of T. So N D over the sum of T. This is a uh, space mean speed. Uh, that's not how you do it. There's not really a good abbreviation for it, so all this N is is the number of vehicles in your count. Uh, so it's in this case four. D is the distance over the roadway that you're analyzing. It's given in the problem statement as one kilometer, which it'll be given more than likely in U.S. units on the test. This book just does like this. And then over the sum of your time, which is 1.6 plus 1.2 plus 1.5 plus 1.7. So that's four, five, six, and 11, 10, 13. That's two there, so that's six. Is that right? Yeah. So then your answer then just turns into uh, four six or zero point six seven. And let me get the units for that. D is the distance. It's given right here. The distance of the roadway you're analyzing. Well, it's, 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 in kilometers, it's in kilometers per minute here. Um, it could ask you for kilometers per hour. Then you just change, change it from hours to minutes. But like I said, it'll probably be in English units on the test. This book just happens to be in metric. I don't think I saw a transportation problem on my test that wasn't in English units. And I know that all the formulas in the book that it gives are all English formulas. So I wouldn't assume any transportation problems would be in that, but it could be. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that you can get is time mean speed. And that formula is similar. It's the sum. Uh, this is time mean speed. And it's equal to the sum of D over T over N. So that's the sum of D over T all over N. Uh, that's time mean speed. And those are the four equations that were on mine that weren't in the formula book. So it might be useful to put to memory. And I can work through this one too. You got d over t, so your distance is one. So you just have the inverse of your time here. It's one over one point six. One over one point two plus one over one point five plus one one point seven is two point seven one three over your n is four. Let me make sure that's right. I don't think that's right. Yeah, that's right. Okay. <laughs> it's point six seven eight. I got over there on the board now. So this is equal to um, zero point six seven eight. 
And at seeing kilometers per minute again as well, I'm pretty sure. Yes, the same kilometers per minute. That's pretty much the only like um, stuff that you'll need to know that isn't in. I'll leave those two formulas up now for a minute if you need them. Uh, that wasn't in the formula book. Everything else is pretty much straight off when I'm looking at some factor or another. Um, I do want to cover this real quick before we move on. These diagrams are extremely helpful and you can see them in, you can see them in a couple different ways. Um, one, they can just give you, they can give you anything on this diagram really and then ask you something about it. Um, they give you th these three diagrams but not label what they are. Um, they'd have to label like one of these and they wouldn't label this as flow or something like that. They would give you say the density here is this um, and they give you that value but they go what is this value. They could do that. Um, they could ask you to compare the, the graphs, which if you look, this is flow to density, flow to speed, and then density to speed. So they're all related. It's just a matter of um, working through the relation. There's an example of that in this book on one of these pages, if I can remember. I've got it, I've got it on one of the problems. I'm going to work if I get time to it. But it's not necessarily as important as the other two that I told you. Uh, um, I'm just going to work through some problems now. Um, I clicked the wrong button. That button. And then once I finish working through a couple of problems. Uh, so th this problem here relates to the last uh, equation that's not in the formula book that you might need to know. It is, but it's a special case of that equation. Um, and that's the stopping site distance equation. So what you need to know is if you look in your books, on your formula books or whatever, it gives you a stopping site equation. This guy is for breaking distance. Um, what you need to know about your stopping site equation, I'm fixing it right on the board over here. It's S is equal to 1.47 VT um, plus V square divided by 30 times <coughs> A over 32.2 plus or minus G. Okay, so that's the stopping site distance equation. It's in your formula book. What you need to know about this is, this is what's called decision site distance. Um, so this is the distance it takes a person to actually make the decision to stop or to press the brake or anything like that. It's also considered reaction time distance. Um, they're the same, same ordeal. Um, so this is decision slash reaction. And this one is breaking site distance. So this is how long it actually takes the car to break once you start braking. Um, what, this what this equation leaves out though, is if this is your initial state, it's minus V naught, uh, <coughs> this would be V naught, this would be V1. The reason it leaves it out in that equation is because this is zero wherever you're considering stopping site distance. If you're just wanting braking distance, then this is your second speed. So that's what we have to use over here. Does anybody know what A is? Does anybody know uh, what T is? Because that is typically a value that's supposed to be known and probably won't be given. If it is, it might be given in the first like couple pages of the test. T is 2.5 and A is 11.2. Okay. That's right. So typically, unless it's given otherwise, use A as 11.2 and T as 2.5. Uh, this is seconds, and that's uh, seconds per foot square, I think. I'm not really sure. 
Uh, all it is is a gravity factor. So what we need to do for this problem, you can get rid of this, you know, for this part. So this is only really equation that we're, that's our braking distance is governed by. So we come in here and we see that a car hit the wall at 35 miles per hour. So we know that's the final speed. We know that it traveled 60 foot on gravel before it hit the wall, and it traveled 30 foot on pavement before it hit the wall, going at that speed, uh, well, and it ended at that speed. It wants to know the initial speed on the pavement. I should have put that on. So to solve this problem, it's a grade, if there's no grade, it gives them friction factors. Uh, which, I didn't put that in. If uh, the friction factor is given, then it changes the SSD. I don't think that's in here, this one. Okay, so don't worry about the friction factors in this one. Um, it would change the bottom part of the equation, but I'm pretty sure that's not uh, gonna be a necessary aspect. But what it will do is it, this, this equation considers that L is 1, so you can do it one step. So essentially all it will be is uh, V is equal to the 90 feet. And then your V naught square minus, let's say 35, 35 square over 30 times 11.2 over 32.2. Um, and you just solve that equation for V naught. So that's essentially all that equation is. If it does give you a friction factor, let me see if I can pull that formula real quick. I have it right here, I'll just give you that formula. shouldn't be an aspect, but don't, don't worry about it giving you a friction factor. Just be able to do the, you know, um, it's, a, it's a pretty simple equation. It's, down here, it's, uh, I don't know what this constant is, but this bottom changes to a constant times F minus G is all the bottom changes to. Uh, there is a constant that I can't remember right now. Do we use T? <laughs> You don't use T in that equation because it's a braking sight distance. Uh, if it asks for decision sight distance, you would use T uh, because decision type sight distance is the uh, one, 1 1.25. It's the first part of this the braking sight. 1.47 VT. So decision sight distance 1.47 VT, and then the braking distance was the other part of the equation. So you just split the equation. that off of a um, metric test and I forgot to get the friction factor formula. So. Okay, so I'm just going to do it this way. Oh, wrong one. I'm going to do it this way instead of having to write the problems on the board. Take a little less time. Um, see if there's another one here. I've got to look. This is. Here's your key power factor one that I was. I told you I'd do it a little later. 
So this equation is, oh, you can't. So it gives you that as your inputs, and it asks for the peak hour factor and the peak rate of flow. Okay. So we know that the peak hour factor is, our, uh, is 4 times the peak 15 divided by the uh, sum of that hour. Right? So that gives us 23. 32, 4,200 in the bottom, and then our top is 48, it's 4,800 in the top. So that's our peak hour factor. Um, and then our peak flow rate is this number right here. Because the four times peak 15 is your peak flow rate. They can ask, I've seen, uh, I've seen an example test where they didn't even put numbers in it. They just said, um, the question stated, what is the top factor in the peak hour factor? Uh, what is the numerator in the peak hour factor equation? So it's just four times the peak 15. I've seen another question ask what the denominator is, and it's just the peak, the peak hour volume. Is that formula supposed to be maybe flipped since it's the answer choices are all less than one. Oh, yeah, my bad. These should be like this. I'm pretty sure. I'm quite sure. That was my fault. I got to write it quickly. Should be reversed. <coughs> uh, the sum hour should be on the numerator, and four times peak hour should be on the bottom. Be good day. That's my thought. Thank you for catching that. I'm trying to run through a lot of stuff really quickly. It's hard to keep up. So this is four times p. Fifteen. This is the sum of the hour. This is 4,200, and this is 4,800. And then 4,800 is still the answer to the second question. So I want to show you one more thing that we don't really get introduced to here. Oh, that's a traffic matrix. It's in this if you have this yellow book, it's in this yellow book. It's the first example uh, in transportation. This is traffic matrix. Uh, essentially, we just, um, most of the time we don't actually cover traffic matrices. So, what we'll do is I'll explain how to actually develop a graph from that. Um, essentially what you do is you look at this as your uh, two, this as your, well this is your from and this is your two. So you're coming from one to one, there's no link. You're coming from one to two, there's a link. So if I draw six nodes on the board, This is one, two, three, four, five, six. And you read across from one to one, there's nothing. From one to two, there should be a link. Um, and it's, right now it's both directions. So when you first draw it, it's both directions. Um, from one, two, three, nothing. From one, two, four, nothing. From one, two, five, and from one, two, six, there's a 
connected line. Okay, so then you go to two. From two to one, there's already a link there, but this just, but whatever, it doubles like that and ensures it's two directional. So if there's one on both sides, it's two directional. Um, you go two to three, there should be one here. Uh, two to four, two to five, two to six, should be one here. Then you go three to two. There's already one, so that's a two directional. Three to one, uh, three to four should be one. Three to five should be one. There's not three to six. Four to three already exists, so that's two way. Uh, four to five, should draw it. Four to six. Five to one, that one is this, so it's two way. And then you get over here to five to three, and it's a negative one. So what that means is you take the lane flowing from five to three away. So this lane's here, so we take one of the directions away, the one that goes from five to three, so this turns into a one directional lane. Um, and then you go through and you see that they're all the same. And then the questions asked, they're below the table there. Uh, the person asked the total number of bidirectional lengths in the network. So it's, you can do it by just looking at the um, graph and counting your numbers. Um, the only thing is you can't count 1 to 2 and 2 to 1. So it kind of gets confusing to do that. So the easiest way that I, I determined was just draw it out. It, they're usually not very large. You can just draw them out pretty simply. Um, so then you just count these. So you can say one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. So there's seven bidirectional links. There's one more between six and five. Oh, I missed that one. Eight bidirectional links. I didn't actually do the six to fives. And then the next question I asked the total number of arcs in the network. No, it's crooked just so long as I can get it on the page. Total number of arcs in the network. You can do that by looking at your graph here and seeing you just have one. Or you can just count the number of negatives in your matrix. The number of negatives in your matrix should be the number of arcs in your graph as well. If you, as you can see, there's just one negative in this matrix. Is there any confusion about that? That's kind of a new. It's just a different way to look at a traffic network. Can you run through that one more time, please? Uh, run through actually drawing it or just figuring things out? Okay. Your bidirectional links for your matrix. Okay, the bidirectional? Yeah. Okay. So whenever you draw the network, you start. This is the node you're coming from. This is the node you're going to. So you go from one to one there's no link. From 1 to 2, there's a link. So you just draw a link there. It has no direction. It, it's a link there, and you assume bidirectional whenever you first draw a link. Um, unless it's a negative, and then you can go on and discard one direction. Um, usually the negatives are down here, though. You, so you go 1 to 3, no link. 1 to 4, no link. 1 to 5, something exists. 1 to 6, something exists. You go down here, 2 to 1. Well, you already have one to two from this. Two to one just ensures that there's a link in the other direction. Um, essentially, when there's a one, it tells you there's a link from that node to the other node. So that's a one directional link. The only way that I, reason I say to draw it bidirectional as your assumption is because when you get here, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to worry about throwing multiple arrows into your graph. You can just assume it, and then whenever you hit a negative one, you can take one of those arrows away. And the only time you'll ever see a negative one is if there is a link that exists there, but you can't go in that direction. So like five to three, there's a link between five to three, but it's one directional, and you can only go from three to five. So when you draw a link, is it automatically assumed by directional? Mm -hmm. Or like let's say just drew two? That's the way I do it, just because it's easier for me to do it that way. Technically, whenever you draw a link from one to two, it should just be a one-directional link from one to two. 
Um, but but if it's not bidirectional, then this will be a negative one, and you can get rid of it there. If that was a zero, then it would still be. It won't be a zero. Uh, if there's a link there, it'll either be one or negative one. Um, the only way it's a zero is if there's not a link there. So all the zeros should have a corresponding zero on the opposite. Yes. So I think four to one, one to four. One to three, three to one. If you can find something that disproves that, tell me, but that's the way I learned it. Uh, so. If you have more than six, this is what you actually draw it out. It's active. I doubt you'll have one that large. If you do, um, you can do it just looking at the graph. Just make sure that uh, you just count like one to two and two to one. You don't count both as a bidirectional link because one's one direction, one's the other. That's pretty much the only way. There's not really a formula that I know of to calculate it based on like your matrix. I'm sure there's probably one out there, but I'm not sure what it is. But every, the only one I had on my test, I had one of these on my test, and it was a 4x4, four four, so, I mean, it was smaller than this one. So you know where that would be 1, 2, 4, 3? 1, 2, 3, 4, however you want to label it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where your nodes are. The only thing you're counting is the number of links. Those are, those are the only ones that really we've never seen before that I've covered, so now I'm just going to kind of go through some of the examples that we have seen just to make sure refresh memories um, I have a bunch of them chosen but I'm only going to cover a couple of them because of time and everything so we'll go with number 17 this book. I'm in a different book now but um what page is that? this isn't this isn't a book you have I doubt but oh you do have it okay. <coughs> It's on page 77. Um, so this is the question. Which of the following is a prominent operating characteristic of closure leaf interchanges? Uh, it says there are no unusual sig signing challenges. Traffic exists before additional traffic enters. There are low speeds on the loop ramps. And there's no weaving traffic between exiting and entering traffic. What do you think the answer is? Does anybody have any idea? Can anybody tell me one that it's not? B. It's not B. That's true. That's that's true for any interchange, unless it's um. The only the only interchange that would be that wouldn't be true for. Uh, that wouldn't be false for would be a single uh, traffic light where it changed for every car that entered. Um, but there's nothing that actually exists in real life that does that. What is a cloverleaf interchange? Cloverleaf, you know what a clover looks oh, like? Oh, okay. Just, that's all it is. That's essentially a cloverleaf. It's a badly drawn cloverleaf, but it's essentially a cloverleaf. Um, you can also throw number D, uh, D out because on any interchange like that, especially um, cloverleaf is usually only used on free freeways or large highways. You can throw D out because it's always weaving traffic between entering and exiting ramps. Um, so the answer is C. It's kind of it's not really a straightforward reason of knowing other than knowing a cloverleaf really well. The only reason I showed this because I wanted to kind of show y'all how to thought process through at least getting it between a 50-50 shot on some of these. There wasn't but one of these on my test and it was really simple. It was asking about a, um, I don't remember, it was some type of intersection and it was a simple one. So it shouldn't be that difficult, but I did want to show you all how to um, think through kind of eliminating a couple of the probabilities or possibilities. Um, <clears throat> okay, so the next one is this number 18, and i got to flip over here and get the solution for it, or at least the formula for it. I can work it without a solution, but I need the formula for it. OK, 
Okay. So this kind of went back to that that I was telling you before when they gave us the F factors. Uh, the A value that we said is typically 11.2. The formula for A is F <coughs> times Thirty-two point two. This equation, this equation gives us that as the coefficient of friction. Um, they'll probably, they might do that, they might not. Um, and you can see here, it gives us F is equal to A over 32.2. That's true, but in most cases, like I say, you just assume 11.2 is not given. So now it actually works. Why does it keep rotating? Okay, to actually kind of work through this problem. We get, I think it's 1.47. So we end up with the stopping site distance of 1.47 times the velocity. I'll just write it. Okay, so your velocity now is 1.47 times I think it's 50 miles per hour. And it gives you a driver's reaction time, which is T of 1.5. And you add that on to 50 square divided by 30 times. It tells you the formula A over 32.2 is equal to F, and it gives you F of 0.65. And then it gives you a grade, a downgrade of 10%. So that's a negative 10%. So you use negative, um, negative 10. Make sure it's make sure I don't have to use a decimal point. Some of these equations you do, and some of them you don't. Okay, so that's in this equation, whenever you use this equation, if you're given a grade, you have to use uh, the decimal form of your grade, uh, which essentially, if you just wanted to remember it this way, is the G you're given over 100. Uh, does that make sense? Some, some of them, this value actually takes account for that. Does it matter that our velocities in miles per hour and our times and seconds? No, because this this 1.47 and this 30 uh, account for that. Account for that. So then you just work through that equation. I need my calculator. I'm just going to walk back and forth the whole time. Okay, so that's the stopping site distance. 
So that's the question that this one asked was what uh, what is the distance required to stop, right? And this question could have asked two other questions as well. It could have asked how long does it take the vehicle, how far does the vehicle's braking distance? Uh, braking distance is just this part of the equation. It also could have asked what's the decision site distance of the driver. In other words, how how far the car travel, travels before the driver decides to put his brake foot on the brake. That would be this distance. So it could ask for any of those three. Just be aware. And if it asks for the this one, don't even worry about calculating this. All you have to do is calculate this out. Uh, if it asks for this one, you don't need this. You just calculate this side out. So just kind of keep that in mind. And it could be three different equations. It could give you that as one answer to the next three questions. First question asks for this number. Second one asks for this number. Third asks for this number. They've done that before as well. That's pretty much stopping site distance. Let me go to a horizontal curve problem. Uh, are y'all done with this? I'll uh, ask the whole question. Good. Let me find a horizontal <laughs> curve problem. What I have in here. All right, so here's a time spacing. Uh, I showed y'all the equation for this, but this one doesn't really use the equation. Uh, can anybody figure out how to find the answer to this? So it gives you 1,400 vehicles per hour, right? It gives you 45 miles per hour. And then it asks the time spacing seconds between vehicles, center to center. So it's looking for something seconds per vehicle. That's what the equation is looking for. So I showed you how to do time, sp time space with like actually giving you volume counts and things, or timings of vehicles. So can you like figure out how to do this one? You don't use that equation, it's actually a lot simpler than it looks. Change the units of what? How many seconds are in an hour? 3,600 seconds per hour divided by 1,400 vehicles per hour. Doesn't that give you seconds per vehicle? So you don't even need the 45 miles per hour there. They just give you that to kind of throw you off. <laughs> so this isn't even a needed variable. Um, the main thing there is just knowing that they were looking for seconds per vehicle and then just being able to change that into that answer that they're looking for. They use the same power. Well, you, you know that this one's vehicles per hour gives it to you here, so you just cancel your hours out and use your seconds. Sample test, uh, practice exam one. So we're going to do number 35. It's pretty much everybody have this book. Does anybody not have it? Okay. I was just going to leave it up here so I didn't have it. Otherwise, I'm going to take it with me and work the solution out of the book.
So number 35, it gives one lane rural road at a 12 degree curve. So the degree of curvature, uh, I think I said 10 and I said 12. That's a 10 degree curve. So your degree of curvature is 10. Um, extending for 700 feet. speed is 45 miles per hour. Spiral transition, okay. It's a spiral transition for me. So the spiral transition, what we're looking for as formula is LS is equal to 3.15 B cubed over RC. So C use one unless otherwise given. And this isn't D here, it's B. Uh, I did I, mean, I didn't read that it was a spiral curve, otherwise it would have been. Otherwise it would have been um, D. So the equation it gives them here, I don't actually see in the equation book, but R is equal to S over V, where S is the um, curve extension, and then V is equal to degrees in radians is equal to the curved degree in radians so it's going to equal to what's that 700 divided by 10 times pi over 180 i don't see that formula in your formula book um, there is this formula so this was an old formula book so they may not actually ask you to find the radius on a question like this. They may just ask you to find the uh, length when given a radius. But this actual equation uses this to find your radius, and the radius will be given as forty ten. So once you do forty ten, you just plug that back into this equation, and you have. 3.15 times 45, I think that's what I said. Yeah, 45 cubed divided by uh, 40, 10 times 
times one. And that should give you the answer. Like I said, this equation is not a very commonly known equation. So if it's not in your formula book, I wouldn't expect them to ask you to do that. Um, it was in my formula book, so not in yours. I would assume they got rid of that. But this is still there, so the key is just make sure you can plug all your numbers in here. So pretty much if we get a formula with a number like that, we're not going to convert any units, any units right? To what? Uh, when I was taking the test, I was worried about units and everything as well. They didn't ever really give me an answer that wasn't in proper units. If it was, it definitely wasn't the right answer. It was just one of those things where they give you four answers. One of them was in like, you were doing an equation in miles per hour, and one of them was in like kilometers per, per kilo hour or something, and you could just throw it out to begin with. It, it was never. Um, Oh, as far as putting them in the equations? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you should, Yeah, I'm pretty sure the formula will tell you what you need. Yeah. Um, but like I said, they, didn't, they weren't ever really tricky with it um, on my test. Like, they give you a number. The main thing they wanted to make sure is you knew what, what equation to use, how to relate it, and then, like on some of these, how the equation changes, like the stopping sight distance to breaking sight distance, or to decision on sight distance, what numbers to pull out to get the right answer. They really weren't trying to be tricky with units whenever I took it. So. Try and find a good one. That's just a simple curve. So that's pretty much all I'm going to do out right here with books. Um, I'm going to show you some actual work through some examples that you might actually have. Um, these are worked out, so I'm just going to kind of walk through them here. Yeah, these are Dr. Zhang's old test problems. I'm going to kind of point out the points that you need to know and the points that aren't really that important on them. So, if you notice in your green book, I in your, I'm going back to Geo, I said green book, in your uh, reference manual or whatever it's called, that it gives you a vehicle signal change interval where it gives you all uh, yellow time and all red time, which are these two equations right here. So this is uh, yellow time and this is your all red time. Uh, here you can see I'm actually calculated in this equation. So we have uh, <coughs> yellow time, T times velocity over 2A plus 64G. Um, I'm assuming that 1.47 that 1 is a conversion factor. So, uh, Yeah, so it, it says in this book that um, the input to this yellow equation is in feet per second. Um, these, these inputs, this U naught is in miles per hour. So that's uh, the conversion for feet per second to miles per hour. So essentially it's just a matter of what you're giving and putting it into the equation. There's not an example problem in one of the test books, so I can't really help you out there with that. But uh, this equation does is fairly straightforward. Um, 
you give your y, and then this is t, which is, uh, it says drive reaction time, yeah, plus 1.47 times miles per hour, or just times feet per second, divided by 2a plus 64.4 times the grade. Um, so essentially it's just plug and chug. You get, for a Y2 here, you have 40, which is here. I can't show it all to you. Can I zoom out some? There we go. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to write it up here so you can see it better. But you have Y is then equal to, this should be a given value that T, um, it should be a given value, it's typically one, but it dep depends on the intersection and it'll be given in the equation. Uh, plus whatever your feet per second is, so here it was uh, times the 40 miles per hour, and then you divide that by 2, A again is usually 11.2, and then 64.4. At times zero because this was in a uh, no grade, so then that gives a yellow time of 3.6 seconds. Um, so essentially, just knowing what values to fill in and what values not to. And then the all red time is equal to W plus L over your speed. So your W is the width of the intersection from curb to curb. So the key here is your W changes if your intersection width changes for each direction. So east to west, your intersection width is 24. North to south, your intersection width is 20. So that's, that's why that number changes. So your AR2, which would be here, is considered north to south. Then you have, okay, so let me, let me clarify this too. If it's asking you for the, alt, for the red distance on the north to south direction, what intersection width should you use? There's two widths. There's 20 <coughs> foot and there's 24 foot, and we're going this way. What width should we use in the formula? What's the answer? 24, because that's the distance that the car actually has to pass across the intersection. Um, so in the first part, going north to south, you're going to have <coughs> W is 24 plus, uh, what's it say, L is length of the vehicle. That'll be given as well, and it gives that as... 20 in this equation, and then divide by 1.47 times 40 again because it's in miles per hour. Uh, well, no, 20, oh bad, I was reading the wrong one, because that's the speed of the north to south. Does everybody understand that? I mean, it's essentially throwing in. The only thing you need to know is whenever you're across an intersection, you want to use the distance the vehicle actually has to cross in the equation if it's two different widths. Uh, that's really the only trick to those two equations. Let's see. We've covered SFD pretty much. There's no need to cover green times beyond that. SSD. <coughs> Just a simple horizontal curve. Uh, okay, so here's one. So this is a sag curve. Um, has an initial grade of negative four, a final grade of positive three, uh, length of 1270, overhead guide sign is being placed directly over the PBI. 
uh, and at what speed limit can the vertical curve be operated? So this is asking for speed V. Um, so to check this, you have to check your stopping site distance. And to do that, you have to use your length equation that it gives you on page 163 of your formula book. There are one, two, three considerations for sag vertical curves. Um, and it tells you in this problem to assume that L is greater than S. So you want to so L can equal to this AS square over 400 plus 3.5 times S. Um, L can also equal to AB square divided by 46.5. And L can also equal to AS square divided by 800C minus H1 plus H2 over 2. Um, so in this question, you know it's not this one because they don't give you an H1, H2, which is your sights of um, where the eye level is of each person in the vehicles. Um, now, the reason you know it's not this equation is typically your riding comfort equation is a lot smaller uh, length than your actual sight distance equation. And this is the safety equation. So usually if you ever have to go with safety, then that's typically the equation you choose. Um, I don't know why they would put something on there that was so vague most of the time they pretty much essentially tell you use stopping site criteria to determine this, use riding comfort to determine it. Um, but if they did, you would always choose the one based on safety. What is the lowercase v for the stopping site distance this is from? What is what now? The lowercase v. Uh, this is just the speed. It's supposed to be the same as this. Oh, it is? Yeah. It's just the speed. So you just plug it back in there and then you get the equation answer as well. You can check that too. If, if for some reason you didn't really actually know which one to use, you know you have each of those equations, they're going to give you four multiple choice answers. So you know they didn't give you H1, H2, so you don't have to use that one. Um, so you can check this other one, this AB square uh, over 46.5. What they give us? A was seven. This equation is that right? Yeah, because A. Does everyone know what A is anyway? Where the seven came from? The initial plus the final grade. Yeah, A is just the difference in the grades. The uh, <laughs> absolute value of the difference in the grades. So it's seven uh, divided by was it forty six point five? Uh, you can multiply it through times the L it gives is 1270. And then take the square root. Yeah, see, that equation gives a speed of 13 miles per hour. So, that, that, they won't be that far off. I mean, they won't be that tricky to give you both of those values. Two ask at what height above the roadway should the bottom of the sign be placed. Um, so that's this other equation that I had. This L is equal to AS squared over divided by 800C minus H1 plus H22 over 2. Uh, instead, he just gave you the 5 in the sense he didn't actually give you the numbers. They'll give you the numbers to plug into that equation. And you just plug them in um, and then solve for C. C is your overhead distance. So that's that's essentially a, all you have to do for a sag curve. Um, are there any questions about sag curves? Uh, you just kind of run through the equations and crank and turn. I 
I have seen a question uh, similar to this. Uh, this one right here. Uh, it's a super elevation question. The formula, I'm not sure if it's, <coughs> it's not. Yes, it is. Okay. It's the side friction factor formula. It's uh, just listed in the book as 0 0.01. E plus F equals B squared over 15R. Um, and that's just a plug and chug as well. If it asks the design speed of a freeway, it gives you the speed of 65 miles per hour. It asks for the super, eleva super elevation. Uh, and then what it gives you here is a degree of curvature of 3. Um, so you just use the equation for horizontal curve. Which I think, yeah, which is this first R equals 5729.58 over two. <coughs> this equation right here just simplifies to that. So you just use that to find your R. Plug your R in, plug your B in, and then your F, um, this was a test, so like you actually had to look it up on a table. They might give you a table to look it up, but they'll probably just tell you the F value, and you just plug and check that as well. There's a lot of questions on here that are relate to others, where they go like, I want you to find this, and you know that this is the equation, but they don't give you the R, so you have to go through and they give you stuff to find the R by using this equation. Um, you, that's really kind of the hardest thing on it is just making sure you get the right formula and then find the other formula you have to use to get the values that go into that formula. Um, that's pretty much the trickiest part about the transportation because like I said, most of it's plug and chug. It's simple. They're going to give you the values. You just have to know what formula to use to get the answer. The horizontal curve equations are fairly simple. I can't find a good example of it for y'all. Um, I'm sure there is one, but I, I got one in my notes, but I couldn't really find the one. Um, but they're pretty much just listed here. Like I said, you just plug a number in and go with it. Um, D is just a degree of curvature. It's They're all listed up here. Um, you only have to use one of these equations, just depending on what equations are given. And uh, that's pretty much it. If you have any questions, ask me. Um, if you want to go through an earthwork example, I can look. I have one laid out if I can find it in this book. Um, but they're they're pretty simple as well. Um, their earthwork formulas are here. The only two that I ever ask you for is the average end area volume or either this pitmoidal volume formula. Um, typically, what it'll do. Here, I'll find one real quick and show it to you. Or if somebody else can find one and tell me what problem number it is. Yeah, here's one. Okay. So essentially what they're going to do is they're going to give you a table like this. Um, it's going to be the station number and the area. It's going to tell you to calculate the area between stations 435 and 565. So all you're going to do if you use the end area method, which is this equation, which is uh, V is equal to L times A1 plus A2 over 2. So you're just going to add the area for A1, which is 435, which is 322, to this 418. You're going to divide it by 2, and you're going to multiply by the length between those two stations. That's sim fairly simple. Uh, the next one is the prismoidal. Uh, you're going to take the length between the two stations and multiply it by A1 is this area. A2 then is this area, the 418. No, A3. Yeah, A2 is this area. AM is what they're calling the middle area. So that's the area of the station between them. It's 395. Uh, so you just multiply that station by 4. 
is what it does in Prism on a law, and divide those by six before you multiply. Would you say A1 and A2 were again? I couldn't see. Okay. Oh, my bad. I didn't realize it wasn't in here. So if you're using the end area, I need to write on something other than this book. The end area, let me write the formulas down real quick. V is equal to L times A1 plus A2 over 2. And V is equal to L times A1 plus 4 AM plus A2 over 6. Okay, so the only way that it, the only thing that I ask you is to find these. Um, your A1 is whatever the state first station you have's area is. So 435's area is 322. So A1 here is equal to 322. Your A2 is your last station's area, so it's 565, and here is 418. And then AM is what they call the middle area, so it's the area in between. And this one it's simple because there's just one station in between them. So you just take that station's 395. Uh, and that's what you take there. If they have multiple stations in between them, typically what's done is they use the uh, end area method to find the middle area. And then you use the prism model with the VM found by the end method area. So in other words, you take like, if it asks you from 435 to 6, then you would take five to five, six, five. Uh, you take the 500 to the 565 station and use the end, more, end, end depth method to find the total area there. And then, um, that's typically what's done. You just kind of average it out, throw it in. Uh, but most, most of the ones I saw, there were three stations. They gave you a first station, the middle station, and the end station. Um, and that's all you really had to do. Is there any other questions? I mean, I've kind of covered in a broad, broad spectrum pretty much anything that is in the transportation field. I may have missed one or two small things. If you have any specific questions, ask. Um, I'm in my office, I won't say most of the time. I'm in my office a lot of time. I stay pretty busy, but my office is... Um, <coughs> My office is um, 231 Walker. I'm at the desk by the microwave. Uh, if I'm not there, leave me a note or something. I can come by later. I'll get it. And then my email is. Uh, so if you have any questions, you run into a problem you can't figure out. Ask me if I can't figure it out, I'll ask somebody else. Uh, is there a problem any of y'all just want me to work through out of the book that you've had trouble with? If not, I'm done. I'm hot and ready to go. Thank you. Thank you very much.